Okay, good morning again. It's, um, we had a nice trip in. It was dry, but then it got foggy in Indiana. Um, it was a nice drive. The, uh, let me start with the first announcement. Do you remember uh, Thurston and Bonnie Miller, who came for a while? Uh, uh, Thurston Miller's mother passed away. Um, when they left, they were, they've been taking care of her for the last eight or nine years or something like that. She called, you know. She went to be with the Lord, and he's got four children. Her memorial service is going to be Saturday, the 10th, at 3 p.m. at McCor McCoy Memorial Baptist Church. That's 134 St. Clair Avenue, Elkhart. No flowers, dress casually, no black. Okay, that's okay. Do you need that to address repeat it at all? I'm sorry to say that Jean won't be here next week, uh, next Sunday, so we'll need someone to lead the singing. A letter with the April, of the, the Chicago conference dates, it's for the April meeting, or it's going to start in March, no, April 26th. Um, the show uh, April meeting it dates is on the is on the book table. It's the, called the Soldiers Training for Service Ministry Conference, and students will be able. It's for the April twenty sixth, April twenty sixth through twenty eighth. Um, the summer conference will be July twentieth through the twenty fifth. So the April conference coming up, April twenty sixth. That's Friday, twenty seven and twenty eight, and then the summer conference will be July twenty. July 20th through 25, 25. And yeah, the letter's on the table there. I think I said that, but thank you, wife. Also, Shorewood South will hold their annual conference on March 16. And as always, we take the tables down today. Now, um, I've had a very interesting week. Now, you people all know how laid back and calm and gentle I am, right? <laughs> you know that, right? Okay. Well, we've had the snow and all the melting and the rain and all that. And we have, we have two sump holes in our house. And uh, there was an addition built on before we bought it in 1978. It's from, our house is 100 and some years old, 103 or something like that. And in the new addition, there's a sump hole. But the, uh, the first sump hole in the old house is a little lower than the new house. So we didn't always need a, a, a ejector pump there because the, the old one got it. But things went here. Another, the new one had all this four-inch drain tile that they put around, in, you know, in additions. And uh, my wife said to me, have you heard the, the new sump pump running uh, constantly? Or what's that noise down in the basement? And went down there. And it's the, the, uh, the new sump pump in the new edition that's running all the time. I took, and, and, and I took it, plugged it up, plugged it up, took the plug out, and just swung it around. The water goes up, but it doesn't go down. And I'm still calm and gentle and laid back. You know, you know I, I trust you people. What are you all laughing for? Um, I do that sometimes. So then we, uh, other things happened that I won't get into, but we, it was a Stephen, Stevenson half- Horsepower, horsepower, horsepower pump. Is that right? Stevenson? No, not Stevenson. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to get through this. I'm trying to teach you a lesson. Maybe you can learn it for your own lives. I don't know. I'm still calm and collected and cool. <laughs> I can. Anyway, we bought a new pump and it there's the PVC that you attach it to to the water to go out. And I'm down there. I says, let's see if the real pump works. So I, and Deb's looking out the window. I'm down in the basement. And I plugged it in. Water's coming out. But it's not going down. I, I don't know. It's just swirling around in the tub. You know, it's just all, you know, you know usually rainwater is clear and all that. So we get to the point, okay, we're going to try to put a new pump in there. It's, a, it's another half horsepower pump. 
Yeah, and there's, there's uh, something, to, the, the PBC needs to be made taller to, to match the rubber union that brings it out there. And it was a comedy of errors. I mean, you know how you do the PBC and the, I measured wrong, I think the measured one, one, I put it in the wrong hole, and, but then we had to do it again. And Now, two times I calmly said I quit. And I walked upstairs, and I walked back down, and I started again, and I quit again. Well, I did it the third time. Let's put it that way. So we got the thing working, and it's now pumping water out to keep our house dry and, uh, because we stuck with it. But uh, I wasn't always calm and collected. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and we're still married. Second Thessalonians lesson forty. Um, let's read. The, let me get to the. We'll get out of here pretty soon. Second Thessalonians. Chapter one, verses ten to twelve. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore, also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for this time in your, in your word, and as always, just may it redound to your glory, because we're not deserving of any of it. Amen. Um, Colossians 1.16, now we're talking about the heaven, heavenly government and the, the earthly government. 1.16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Now these are telling you things. If there's invisible things we can't see, but it's going on in that second heaven. Whether there be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Now, Sam did a good job on, on the what he talked about. When you understand grace, you understand that nobody ever comes to the Lord by their own works. Ever. It's always by faith. And he used Romans 3.30, which shows, you know, by faith and through faith. Israel, when they, God told them what they needed to do, they did it. Moses was willing to kill his own son, right? And then the angel stayed his hand. God wanted to see if he'd be willing to do it. Abraham, I'm sorry. Yeah, Abraham. God stopped his hand. They found a ram in the thicket. And, but nobody. So when people, what they do, they forget verse 30 and they go to 31. See, you've got to support the law. But what does verse 19 and 20 say in Romans 3? For by the law is the knowledge of sin. It shows you that you're a sinner. There's no work anybody can do everywhere, anywhere, that can get you to, get you to be in favor with the Lord. No work. And that's one of the big understandings of dispensationalism. Because they come to that passage and they go to the last two verses and they don't understand that. Because in James it says you've got to work, right? Well, that's the way God, that was the dispensation of the law, said you had to do this to get that. And we know that early on in Exodus 19, God, uh, the Moses said to the people, you know, they said everything the, Lord's, everything the Lord wants, we're going to do. But, you know, they failed the five tests of the wilderness before that. And they said, okay, that's the biggest mistake ever since Genesis, you know, uh, Genesis 3. And we're going to do it. And all through Scripture, you read about something called the work of their hands. And they think that the work of their hands is something that, you know, they can do and they can become more righteous before God. But nobody's righteous except in the Lord. It's his righteousness, it's his glory, it's his power, it's his works, it's his world, it's his work, you know, it's his visible and invisible dominions, it's his. We did nothing to create it, we, can do, we can't do anything to keep it going, it's up to him. Nothing's left to us except for faith in something that's important. Now, as I told you before, Debbie and I didn't know this for quite a while, and um, well, that's when we got saved there. Um, they were created for his reigning, to accomplish his will, to execute his purposes in his creation. He had a reason for the creation, 
and he created these governmental authorities to carry on his business in earth and in the heavens. Colossians 1.17 says, He is before all things, and by him all things consist. This is a doctrinal issue. Everything in his universe is dependent upon his purpose. It is very clear that he is before all things. And let me give you a little Bible history here. Approximately, for the first 2,000 years, that to get you from Genesis 1 to Genesis 11, the nations failed, right? The nations, there was no Jew or Gentile then. The next 2,000 years, the rise and fall of the nations Starts with Genesis 12 and ends in Acts 8 with the killing of Stephen. Now, the next 2,000 years is the time period we're in, the dispensation of grace. Then the millennium. Christian universalism teaches that an eternal hell doesn't exist. That's cropped up its head lately. I don't believe in a hell. There is no hell. Everybody's going to heaven. If you don't understand that there's a hell, you're going to go to hell when you die. It's just that simple. And again, are you willing to gamble on the eternal destination, your your eternal home? Are you willing to gamble on that? Hell does not exist, and and it's it's a later creation of the church. With the churches that go to this universalism. They don't really have used the Bible for biblical truth. They claim, this is one of the things, that the punishment of hell is disproportionate to any any crime that could be committed. Why? Because humans have a finite lifespan. They can only commit a finite number of sins, but hell is an infinite punishment. So in their minds, they're comparing what their wisdom teaches and comparing it to God's word. This is what I think should be done. Well, God's not fair there, so he's got to be doing this. He's got to mean this. And like I said before, you can find anything that you believe, you can find a verse for it in the Bible, but you're taking it out of context. They claim that the, again, Let me read you a couple of verses. Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather for him which is able to to destroy both soul and body in hell. Well, is your body infinite or finite? Right. What about your soul? It's infinite. There's a difference in the word kill and in the word destroy. If you look up the word destroy, you're going to find things like a fire destroying things. You're going to find that. But kill doesn't say that. It just ceased from from existing. Matthew 25, 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So my next series I'm going to do on on the alternate Sundays, I'm going to start talking about hell. Okay? So you're going to be learning more about hell. Back to your outline here. Some people get very squeamish about the doctrine of the Trinity. They don't want the second and third person to be equal with God the Father because the second person of the Godhead is the Son, just like we have sons who are an extension out from us. So these people think there was a time when that a child did not exist. But the second person of the Godhead is not like that. Jesus Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit always existed. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is outside of creation. He is before there was any creation. Paul wasn't trying to teach the deity of Christ in Colossians there. But you don't want to miss the fact that it is there. Colossians 1, 18 and 19. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, 
the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in all that in him should all, all the fullness dwell. The key here is it's just not the things on earth, but the things that are in heaven. And this is Pauline Drew. The all things that Israel can't touch are the things in the heavens, the angelic realm. In 2 Thessalonians 1.10, let me read it again. When he shall come to be glorified in all the saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that way, that day. Second Thessalonians is when the Lord comes to take up that reigning. We'll be raptured before that. The, us, the church, the body of Christ. When he comes to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in them that all, that, I'm sorry, when he comes to be glorified in the saints and to be admired in them that, that believe that day, the Thessalonians will be a partaker, just like you and I will be a partaker of that, because this added testimony was believed. So the issue has to do with our additional, with this additional agency that Paul's testimony adds to the doctrine and ministry. Paul wrote 13 of the 27 New Testament books. That's half. Without Paul's ministry, Jesus Christ would not be admired in all those positions. I can stand here and say, I fully believe this. There's nothing anything can do in and of ourselves to get any credit with God. Everything, the glory and all, you know, people... I think I walked in that house one time. They had 2 Timothy in from King James on a wall when you walk in. But they were full of prayers. I had to go out and pray and be holy to God. I'll be more clean. Don't touch me if I get through. You know, once I get through a prayer and I've got a clean, clean body inside and out. They have all these weird things that man's mind or man's wisdom comes up with. And you're every turn of the, of the page or every turn of the street, you're going to have a religion battling you, especially inside your own body for things you might have believed in the past or maybe think, you know. So this universalism is coming on, and, and it's wreaking havoc in, in some places. Some good preachers have gone to universalism, that there's no hell. Maybe I'm just dumb. I got my feet stuck in the mud, and I'm not going to move anywhere because this is truth, you know. I got, we got the sump pump to work, you know. There was a couple times when I was frustrated. I walked, but I walked back in, got it done. But there is an issue of what we do now, and our conduct now affects the admiration that he gains through us. So that means anybody who's in a religion that thinks works is, is going to get you righteousness, anything even close to that smell is wrong. And most of Christendom, D-U-M-B, being facetious, is, is, is in that camp. Why do you think it's easy for me to say to people, you know, when you learn this, nobody's going to really like you. Galatians 4.16, am I therefore become your enemy? Because, you know, this, you know, am I therefore become your enemy by telling you this? Second Thessalonians 1, verses 11 and 12. Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Now, again, there is a verse that people could take out of context and say, look, at faith gives me power. And that sets me apart from everybody else. No, everybody's humble. Everybody's deserving of sin. I mean, deserving of hell, I'm sorry. Everybody has sinned. There's nothing you can do. That's why the Bible was written the way it was written. It's not like a child's book. You have, you know, but the, the, the power is in his word, and it works in you inside to get the things done. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. When you approve of something, you count it worthy. Ephesians 1.18 says, the hope of his calling. 
Ephesians 4, 1 says that ye might walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Our calling is not really us. It's his calling. One of the songs I did on my tape, there's a song, the last song on the tape, I, I put, there's a line, he forgave me, saved me, saved me, then he called me. So three things come before a call. To be called today is to understand the words of God and start doing that. He forgave me, saved me, sealed me. Now, I have a vocation if I want. Okay? It is why the Lord chose to form the church, the body of Christ. This calling is not salvation. Forgiven, saved, sealed. Now the calling. And it's the Lord's calling. You are never going to be worthy of salvation in and of yourself, in and of anything that you do or make or create. Now, I'm oh, sorry, it happens when you get saved. It's what happens when you get saved. When you trust Christ, you are put into the body of Christ. In Christ, you have a calling. Now, you are predestinated. Not before that. You have to get saved. You have to believe. No works are involved in that. It's just what you have going on inside of you. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Now, predestinated is used four times in your Bible and Paul. Ephesians 1, 5 says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. My wife is adopted. I told you that before. She's a real Heinz 57. She's got all kinds of mix. Well, uh, what was it, 55% or 40? Uh, you're Italian? Um, 24%. She's Sicilian. You know, I've always been a sucker for uh, dark hair and dark eyes. She's got dark hair and dark eyes. That's a fleshly thing. But we're adopted. She's adopted. And, you know, when you get adopted by people, they love you. They take care of you. In, in Ephesians chapter, look uh, at verse 11, I'm sorry. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. What's God's purpose today? Who have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Forgave me, saved me, sealed me, and then he called me. Get saved and then get called. So we're adopted, we have obtained an inheritance in Christ. Now we know we're going to go to heaven when we die, according to his purpose, not ours. The calling is what God is doing with the church, the body, uh, the body of Christ. Why did he form it? What did he intend to do with it? He is talking about something that is greater than not just being saved, but it is something in which you can participate in your salvation. Forgave me, saved me, sealed me. Now he called me. In that order, what does God call us to do? Are there principalities in the heavenly places looking down on us now? Yeah. That just bothered the heck out of me. You know, I mean, when you start thinking about things, you know, being intimate, you know, it's just say, I got people watching me. You know, I mean, I don't want anybody to watch me. Because I'm not perfect. <laughs> and occasionally I do make mistakes. Especially when I'm reading. Um, Ephesians 2.7. And then the ages to come. See where you're here. We're in this area. Right here. Present time period. He might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ Jesus. He is going to do that for every member of the body of Christ. But for some members of the body of Christ, there is going to be a different level of admiration than for others. I'm not trying to make this a, a contest. This is personal, and it's God doing this work in you. Some people are going to get a little farther than it, and some people less, but we're all going to be saved. Okay, 1 Corinthians 3 talks about it, says that. 
And we have learned that this depends on our understanding of Pauline truth. Actually, the whole Bible. God's last message for mankind. Boy, does that get people upset. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? You don't want to hear the truth? Okay. We know that we are not going to face our sins at the judgment seat of Christ because the cross took them away. The cross takes care of sin, the guilt, and the failure and the payment for everything, as the following verse explains. Romans 5.19, For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of all shall many be made righteous. righteous. Folks, it's his obedience, not mine. Once you trust him, now, now, now you're righteous. Forgave me, saved me, sealed me, and he called me. It's his obedience that makes me righteous. Because any time we do anything that's any good, it's because of God's word in us. And we're, well, that's why I came back two times to do the finish the simple thing. Okay? But, I, you know, I'm just fed up with it. You're getting in this small place. I'm 73 years old. I can hurt. I need three points to get up now because one of my knees is, you know, and you got all these pains and aches and, you know, you're moving here, and it's a real cramped space. Am I going to be down there singing and whistling like I'm happy? No. I was mad at the sun pump and sun pump. I can be mad at that. But we got it done. We got done. Now, this is in the sense of Philippians 3, 14. Here's what Paul says. Paul, our apostle, who saw the Lord. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He knew he wasn't perfect. We should know that too. Last week we talked about being prototypes. Here is a pre-picture of the reality that comes later. In Leviticus, when the priest looked at the sacrifice, he never looked at the person who brought the sacrifice. He looked at the sacrifice if it was without spot or blemish, not the person that brought the sacrifice. He didn't say the person had to be without spot or blemish. When you think about the Lord's obedience, he is the one without spot. He is the one without blemish. Don't worry about you. Look at him. There is nobody like the Lord Jesus Christ. It is only him. He is the worthy one. You're not only as a child of God, but now you're a saint of the Most High God, as one who was created in Christ under good works, which were ordained before, I'm saying that, which were ordained that we should walk in them. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So when he predestinated the body of Christ, okay, there's some good works these people do that he wants us to do. So it's like the, the, the train. If you want to get from Chicago to New York on a train, how do you get there? You buy the ticket. If you want to go to heaven, what do you do? You trust in the Lord, not in yourself or in your own works. It's that simple or that, that hard, depending on how you want to make it. Here's the purpose God has for the body of Christ. Philippians 1, 9, 9, 129. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Now, if I'm being truthful and I'm like standing in a confession here, I'm confessing to all you guys, I wasn't real happy yesterday. I didn't feel real good being down there bent over, my knees are on concrete and all that, you know, and you know, but we got the job done. And we're still married. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Philippians 3:10 says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. So after the job was done, and after all that pain, I'm thinking, what's this pain later on? Feeling a little guilty. What's this pain compared to what the Lord went through? I mean, you know, he was sweating blood. You know, it's, it's, you, you put it like that, it kind of... It makes everything just, you know, it puts it in the, in the proper perspective, I guess. 
You learn an intimacy with the Lord and an appreciation of his grace. God's redemption at Christ's expense. 1 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 7. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, one to thou hast attained. Okay? You, you, you want to be on an incline level learning God's word to help with your own self, your own inner man, your own struggles, your own anger at a sump hole. You know what I mean? You, you want that. But refuse profane and old wives' tales, fables, and exercise thyself rather under godliness. All this religion, religious mumbo-jumbo out there, let it come in one ear and not the other. Now, Sam went to Leviticus 12. Let's go there again. Let me read you verses 1 to 4. We talked about this last week. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived, conceived seed and born a man-child, then, then she shall be unclean seven days, according to the days of the separation for her infirmity shall she be unclean. And the eighth day of the flesh, and in the eighth day, of, eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And she shall then continue in the blood of your purifying three and thirty days. She shall touch no hollow thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. So, seven, think, again, last year, I, last week I said, think each day is a thousand years. Seven in the Bible is a timing in creation. Seven is the number of perfection in regard to the timing of things, the accomplishing and maturing of something. And 12 is the number of the nation of Israel, is the number of the governing of his creation, the, div the division of it. There are seven days in creation. God created the heaven and the earth in six days, and in the seventh day he rested. When you get to Leviticus, God will take and move the seven days to seven weeks. All right, so you've got to think about this. In, in, in Matthew, um, Christ talks to the, to, the, to the priest and all that in the first 12 chapters, and finally he got to a point where he says, I'm done with these guys. I'm going to start speaking, speaking in parables. And he did. So you get to Matthew. There's seven parables in Matthew. The first four are out of the house of Israel. The next three are in the house. So you have a separation of seven, four and three. The first 2,000 years in the Bible, you can see approximately from Genesis 1 through 11. The next 2,000 years from Genesis 12 through Acts 8, when Stephen got killed. The next 2,000 years, almost, is the dispensation of grace. Now, if you go with the Bible numbering, and I'm not, you know, people do try to think, well, what's the rapture going to happen? Well, in my Bible, it says that a, a, a term, so creation began in, in, in the year uh, 4004, something like that. Pardon me? B.C., yeah, brother B.C., and then, how can I put that? When you get when you, you go through the four thousand years, you got the, you know the before ch uh, chapter eleven, and then after chapter twelve, you got another two thousand years. Then when you come to to, to to Jesus Christ, it says that he was born in four B.C. Okay, now Israel made some kind some kind, of, kind of correction that took away those four years, okay? So I'm going to go from 4,000 then, then to the, you know, the, the next thing, the next time period that we have right now is a time period where we are in, and from 34 A.D., or 30 A.D., if you count the years, the 2,000 years would end in 2030 or 2034. Now, am I going to write a book about the rapture of the body of Christ? 
that says that, even though those are the exact, I don't know if the, the numbers are, are exact or true or not. Their calendars are screwed up all over the place, you know. But we know it's going to happen. And we know that we are in a winter time period in the world, in the entire world, which major wars happen, not just things like Korea or Vietnam. It's, it's a major thing. And things change after a winter season in war. What's our defense for that? How should we prepare for that? Are we busily buying guns and ammunition and stocking up? You know, a guy throw a grenade in your house, he can take you out right away. They got bigger guns, bigger, more people, this and that. Should we have some protection? I said, I think so. What should be our concentration? What should we be thinking about? Instead of getting all hyped up about what's going on, where you see these evil forces at work, In Genesis 1 to 11, Enoch was found righteous in the eyes of God, Genesis 5. And then he found Moses, Noah, I'm sorry, Moses, Noah righteous, and his, and his wife and, and three sons and their daughters. There's verses in there that said Canaan, or Ham, his son, and I mean Ham, had, saw his father's skirt. Now, there's some thinking that he might have had relations with her, maybe forcefully, okay? So God says to, to, to Noah, you're, you're a righteous guy. I want you to take this the you know, next 120 years, build the ark, you know, make it like a box so it doesn't sink, and everybody else is going to be killed, except the angelic spirits. It's always an attack on the seed line. What did the angels do in Genesis 6? They went into women, all right? They made these giants, these, these creatures, infecting the seed line. And so the seven weeks in, in this is how you get the Pentecost. So we start the seven days. Then you have the seven weeks. Seven times seven equals 45 day, 49 days. Going to the Feast of Pentecost on the 50th day. Then you have the seven months, which is the Feast of Trump, Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles. All in the seventh month. Now I know this is this is hard stuff, but trumpets equal the ga- regathering of Israel. Atonement is the second coming. Romans five eleven says we now have the atonement. The people want the people want to change that word to reconciliation. We already know about reconciliation. Atonement is you're you're, you're clear. You have it. Tabernacles equals the millennium, the next thousand years that's going to happen. What we've been talking about here, okay. This is the finality of Israel's calendar of redemption that starts with the Passover and ends there at the millennium. Then you move from the seven months to the seven years. Then you have the seven weeks of years when you get to the year of Jubilee. What are the seven years? Time of Jacob's trouble, right? Okay. What is that? In the Bible, where, is it? where do you see that? Revelation, right? See it in the book of Daniel and all that? Then you have the seven weeks of years when you get to the year of the Jubilee. If you go to, let me just, in Leviticus 25, it's called the year of Jubilee. Let me tell you what it is. It's relief from every kind of oppression. Now, this is for Jews because of the hypoc- theocratic form of government. Go to Isaiah chapter 9 and let me read you verses 4 to 7. It's free from every kind of, you're freed from every kind of profession. Oppression. In Isaiah chapter 9 verses 4 to 7. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us is a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, 
And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Peace, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever and ever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So it's relief from every kind of oppression because of this theocratic form of government. There's five points here. One, the people will be at rest. Two, the land will be at rest. Three, all debts are settled, free from economic depression. Four, servants are set free. There were some Jews who got in trouble. They had to be a servant to another brother Jew, but they're going to be set free. And five, God is the provider of all what Israel needs. And where is our jubilee today? Anybody have a thought? Where, where is that? Colossians 2.10, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. That's our jubilee. We're going to be free from all the pressure, from living in these bodies down here, from getting mad at the sump pump. You know, it's, it's, we're going to be free from that. And that's going to be something. So the sevens are constantly working throughout God's orderly system. Okay? In the last seventh day, the millennial kingdom turns out to have a time period involved, just a thousand years. Then you realize, 2 Peter 3 8, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. And now you, are, you see the connection with the prototype, which shows the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Somebody that my wife talked to before, she knew in school, Debbie had a Bible study for a while at our house, for women, and, and she, she mentioned this connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And uh, this girl didn't, didn't like to hear that, she didn't believe it. But then recently, when she was talking to another friend, she said, I think Debbie was correct. I said, well, so it was the word of, word of God that was correct. But she, she heard or, something, or saw something, she, she now sees a connection. So that, you know, when you talk about the Jubilee with Israel, how many people know about the Jubilee? And it's only one E at the end, okay, just six letters. How many people, how many Christians know about that? And then if, if, if you have something, you know, we've been talking about there's things in heaven that are like the things on earth. There's a lot of things in the same, you know. Where's our jubilee? It's in Christ. It's not in anything we do. He wants us to do things. He wants us to do things that make him proud. We're not always going to do it, but he wants that from our, from our behavior. He wants us to press toward the mic and mark on that. Every dispensation has a transition into it. From Adam to Moses, if you go back to the dispensation of promise, it began with Adam. The dispensation of promise had a transition into it. They were in the Garden of Eden first, then they sinned, and then you go into the dispensation of promise with the seed of woman, and then Cain and Abel, and so forth. Cain had two wives. Did the Lord ever say to get multiple wives? Never said that. From Moses to Christ, you come to Moses, and you move into the dispensation of the law. Right here. The Gospels. Okay? And it's all the way from back there. The law does not start in Genesis. It starts in Exodus. Technically, the law covenant does not come into effect until Exodus 24 when they sprinkle the blood on the book. But they make a covenant agreement in Exodus 19. They have been out of Egypt for weeks. This is when we're leaving Egypt. They come out of Egypt in Exodus 14. Then they go into the wilderness in Exodus 15. Then they go to Mara, that's the water, and have, a, and have bitter water, which is their first test in the wilderness. Do you remember what God says? I mean, it was bitter water. They, they were saying, why can't God make clear water for us? In Exodus 15, 26, it says, and said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord. This is, you know, 
Moses saying this. And will do that which is right in his sight. And will give ear to his commandments. And keep all his 613 statutes. And will do that which is upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. But when they did, they get... But when, when did they get the commandments? They don't get the commandments until the Lord gives them the law in Exodus 20. He's saying this in Exodus 19. He's just tested, tested them. There's five trials in, the, in, the, in Exodus 15, 16, 17, and, and he tests them, and they fail each test because they're not trusting in Jehovah. They're trusting in themselves or what they think should be done. These waters shouldn't be this way. How come the Lord did this? They weren't trusting in the Lord. The Lord took a tree and threw it in the water, and they were able to drink it. So there's a trans, transition into the dispensation of the law system. Now, the dispensation of grace. When the dispensation of grace begins, there is a diminishing of Israel as the body of Christ is established. There is a transition in the book of Acts from Israel's program to our program. There will also be a transition into the dispensation of the fullness of times. The millennial, millennial kingdom is the last seven years in the beginning of the eternal kingdom. This kingdom lasts forever and begins before the seven days are over. Before that. Because in that kingdom, the psalmist says, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Psalm 110, verse 2. Revelation 2.27 says, And he shall rule them with the rod of iron. Look at that connection. Psalm 110 to Revelation 2, okay? During that millennial kingdom, not everybody's going to be a Lord lover. They're going to be against the Lord, okay? So, and rule down with a rod iron and yet, have enemy in, and yet have enemies in the camp. After the millennium, the eighth day, remember eight is the number of a new beginning, the dispensation of the, the eighth day begins, the dispensation of the fullness of times all enemies are destroyed. Death, Satan, and all enemies will be cast into the lake of fire. They will be gone. Satan is locked up in hell during the millennium, then comes out for the final battle of Armageddon. It's Revelation 16. Revelation 17, 14 says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So death, sin, destruction, rebellion, and everybody associated will face the great white throne judgment. Only saved people, the body of Christ, Israel, and the nations, not ones aligned with Satan, get to be associated with the Lord for eternity in a good way. So the thousand years are a transition but it is important to see it is the last of the seven years, then the cutting off all that offended goes to perdition and all of sin is over with. So, in the eighth, the eighth day, there is a circumcision, the removal of human effort, human contamination. Ishmael is completely gone and only God's program exists. So there is the pattern, the prototype, and the typology. Leviticus 12, 4 says, and, then, and she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying three and thirty days. We talked about that 33,000 years, possibly. Revelation 21, verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now, what does Genesis 1, 2 say? Earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Did the Lord make it that way, or did something happen between Genesis 1, verse 1, 1, 1, 1, 2? You have the waters above and the waters below. It is called the sea. Who gets thrown into the sea? Isn't the devil? The serpent? Sometimes it's called the deep. 
See, that is what happened to it as a result of the satanic rebellion. And that very terminology is used in Jeremiah 4, verse 23, to describe the condition of the earth after the battle of Armageddon. In other words, when Jesus Christ establishes his kingdom, he comes and takes possession of the earth. The description of the battle that accomplishes this is the second verse in Genesis. So the battle that the Lord ends in Revelation began in Genesis 1, verse 2. And I find it interesting that it's backwards, you know, 12, 21, you know. But these things are important for us to know, important for us to believe. They, they will answer questions by people that, that don't have this information. The first thing that we need to do always is see if somebody's saved and then try to give them the, the truth as, as best we can. And if anybody out there uh, haven't, hasn't trusted in the gospel, um, you have to know that you're a sinner. Okay? Acknowledge that in yourself. Then the word says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him to justify the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. If you don't want to go to hell when you die, you need to trust in Jesus Christ and his cross. He forgave all your sins on the cross. And he offers salvation to you as a free gift. And when you die, and you will, you'll wake up in heaven, not in hell. Amen. Thank you. Okay, we're going to close with page four. His name is Wonderful. Mm -hmm.